Good afternoon. Can you introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, my name is uh, Jeff Charlotte, and I am the author of two books about uh, American fundamentalism and politics, The Family and C Street. And I understand you actually became a member of The Family. Uh, can you give me a short... I was working on my first book called Killing the Buddha, which is not an anti-Buddhist idea, but actually this sort of kind of a good mandate for journalists everywhere. Uh, you meet the Buddha on the road, it's only an expression of your longing. It's your dream, your projection. So you got to kill that Buddha to keep going and ask tough questions. And I was traveling around the country, sort of following that idea to look at the varieties of religious experience in the United States, and I was invited by the brother of an old friend to uh, check out this organization, uh, which I didn't know that as the family. Um, and I ended up uh, living with them for uh, a little less than a month. Um, and I was so stunned by what I saw that when I left, uh, I had learned that they had dumped uh, nearly 600 boxes of documents in the Billy Graham Center archives in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, and I ended up moving out there, uh, literally, uh, and immersing myself in those documents, this sort of alternative history of the relationship between religion and politics in America. Now, I understand that they really have tentacles in almost every aspect of uh, not just American government, but world government. Can you uh, give a little summary of what some of their uh, tentacles are? Well, you know, I always, uh, it's a fair usage, but I, I, I don't actually use the word tentacles, because I think tentacles sort of, it suggests a separation of identity, that, that, that they are somehow not, you know, that this is a conspiracy from without. It's not. They, you know, they don't have tentacles within government. They are a part of government. Um, family goes back to 1935 when the founder had this, uh, what he experienced as a vision from God telling him that his mission was to organize not the masses and uh, save not, you know, the souls of ordinary folks, but of, of key men, he called them, top men, political politicians. And that's who he's always focused on. So, I mean, since uh, really they got sort of up and running in an effective way in the early 40s, since then there's always been a significant number of congressmen um, who to greater or lesser degree have um, their primarily religious relationship is through this organization and that religious relationship leads them to uh, political relationships. Uh, I say greater and lesser degree because uh, not everybody, uh, not everybody in it um, is down with the whole program. There's people who maybe go to the their annual event, the National Prayer Breakfast, in which the president speaks, Congress is there, and that's about it. They don't really care. They, you know, they're, yeah, I'm a Christian, whatever. Um, and then there's people like, say, Senator Jim Inhofe, who um, came to Christ largely through the intervention of the family, and now, as he describes it, you know, travels overseas on the taxpayer dime, promoting what he calls the political philosophy of Jesus, which he attributes to this organization. Um, so that's not a tentacle. I mean, that is. That is, right. know, when he goes over to Uganda or, or, or someplace like that, he is the face of the U.S. government. What about the military? I devote a, a long chapter in C Street to fundamentalism within the military. Um, there's some overlap with the family. Um, this story began for me uh, a, a few years ago when I reported uh, on something called Christian Embassy, uh, a ministry within the Pentagon that had been uh, given uh, uh, security clearance incorrectly. Um, in which I had obtained a, a promotional video that they used internally that featured uh, several top flag officers uh, um, testifying that their commitment to Christ was more important than their service to the military, uh, and that they, they mixed the two. That, you know, one guy saying when he goes overseas, he's the aroma of Christ. We had General Bob Caslin who went on to become a superintendent of West Point talking about uh, this kind of stuff. I mean, it was a it was an egregious enough violation um, that the Pentagon did. Ha they had to have an inspector general's report, and when the report came out, it found that yeah, they had violated, they had seriously violated First Amendment uh, things. But there was no penalty suggested. It was really it was kind of whitewashed. So I looked at who had done this inspector general's report. And it was a guy named General Claude Kicklider. So, so who's, who's Claude Kicklider? Well. Among other things, he's on the board of directors. He was on the board of directors of the family. And then I looked at him a little further. In fact, he had been one of the two men who had founded this ministry, Christian Embassy, uh, embassy in the Pentagon. So he had been charged with investigating himself. And what do you know? He found himself not guilty. What about... Uh how does this affect uh, the average person? You know, why should the average person worry about this? 
well, take the case of the military, and, and, and then maybe I'll sort of go out from there. In the military, I just gave you an example of this sort of corruption at the elite level. Um, I ended up reporting on an organization called the Military Religious Freedom Foundation, um, uh, which is dedicated to um, uh, First Amendment rights for uh, military personnel. Um, and they had, in fact, actually contacted me in response to my reporting, saying, you got to check out this problem. And I thought they were overstating the case, that there wasn't really this much of a problem. They said, just talk to some people. Um, and I did. I, uh, I talked to you know, military personnel, all ranks. I went to all the service academies. I went to, uh, to bases and so on. And what I found was a problem of striking pervasiveness. I mean, so severe that one three-star general who does honor his oath to protect and defend the Constitution, I said, how bad is it? He says, it's a fucking clown show. Those are his words. Yeah. But he did so anonymously because he's afraid. Three-star general, he's afraid of the pushback on his career. Now, meanwhile, the, the folks who were speaking openly for fundamentalism for the military, as a Christian military, they were not afraid to put their names to it. In fact, there's a massive organization called Officers Christian Fellowship, which defines its mission as reclaiming territory for Christ within the mil uh, military, not allowing the opposition, all of which is spearheaded by Satan, to stand in, in our way. That's, that's their language. Uh, uh, retired General Bruce Pfister, who was their executive director, described the war in Iraq and Afghanistan as a spiritual war of the greatest magnitude. Meanwhile, uh, another military fundamentalist ministry Chapel Next had the top chaplain in Afghanistan, a colonel, and I obtained video of him uh, preaching in Afghanistan with a t-shirt, with a map of Afghanistan with a cross over it, screaming at the troops that they, the troops, are the new Israel, the new Israel, and that they are called upon to redeem Afghanistan before Jesus comes back. So you ask, how does this affect us? Um, these guys are looking at a very tense situation around the world and say, yeah, where the, you know, the world is on fire with conflict between uh, uh, society, civilizations, fundamentalisms, and they say, let's pour some oil on that. It affects all the people who are in the military. It affects all of us who look to the military as uh, a line of defense. That's just the military. I mean, you start looking at the real erosion, I mean, the deep, deep erosion of democracy. Maybe, maybe it's exemplified by Senator Mark Pryor, Democrat from Arkansas. Now, he's a Democrat, he is uh, uh, anti-abortion, anti-gay, pro-war, anti-labor, uh, anti-health care, but he's a Democrat, uh, son of a Democrat, a prominent Democrat, he's a long Democratic family in Arkansas, Senator Mark Pryor, and I talked to him about his involvement uh, in the family, and um, uh, he explained to me that uh, uh, through the family he had learned that the wall of separation between church and state wasn't really a wall, kind of more like a, a hedge with a lot of paths through it. Um, and uh, he said that through the family he'd also learned a form of, of bipartisanship, ways that everyone could work together. Uh, and he said, he said, look at Jesus. He said, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. That kind of numbskull thinking, and it is numbskull, it's stupid, it's bad theology. I turned to my many, you know, evangelical and Christian friends who are serious about their theology, and this just makes them tear their hair out. The idiotic theology of these of this political religion. Not people doing hard thinking about their faith, but people doing uh, out there sort of using faith to justify their own hunger for power. Um, it erodes democracy, it erodes the idea of the noise of democracy, that we have to have debate, that Jesus came to take sides and came to take over. It has nothing, to, that should not be in the public square. It, it gets us to the point where liberal or conservative, you still gotta invoke Jesus. Uh, you know, people forget Obama, I believe, uh, have to fact check me on this, I believe has already invoked Jesus as president uh, more than any president in history. Um, uh, it, becomes, it becomes the norm that everyone has to agree to. You get to the point where... Uh, For him to look normative to yeah. what he's perceiving, yeah. uh, he has to use that. I, I, I always find frustrating this idea, um, uh, the idea of the faith-based Democrats put out there, this is, you know, this is, you know, Jesus didn't come to, uh, you know, help big corporations. Jesus didn't come to, uh, you know, beef up military power. Jesus came to help the poor. We should do this. We should, we should have, you know, health care because, uh, because Jesus said so. I happen to agree with those political positions. I'm, I'm, I'm a lefty. But we don't do it in the United States 
because Jesus said so. That's the same logic that Jerry Falwell uses. Jerry Falwell, the late Jerry Falwell, would say we do X, Y, and Z because Jesus said so. Now the liberals say we do X, Y, and Z because Jesus said so. And what gets lost in that? In the United States, our government is supposed to be about what we say, what the people say. Yeah. I'm not one of those who says people with faith shouldn't be in the public square. They can. They can come and they say, look, this is what, this is what I base my feelings on. And then they got to be open about that. And then the voters can say, hey, we want to elect that or we don't. But you do have to respect the public square as a space that is not defined by scripture, by Jesus, by anyone's concept of religion, but by we, the people who are in it. Talking about elected, of the 535 people between the House and the Senate, how many have some type of tie to the family? Oh, I don't have a current tally. Most of the, the, the book, uh, the family, I was working on archives that are in the Billy Graham Center archives. And so then I would have membership roles, um, uh, but those only go up to the early 80s. Um, and so typically though, they would, you know, we would be talking at some level of connection about a quarter of the Congress. Mm -hmm. At the deeper connection, a much smaller group. Um, right now, I mean, I can name names. There's Senator Jim, I mean, just living in the family. Right, there's the li living on C Street. That's Senator there, huh? Jim DeMint, uh, guys who have lived there or live there now. Senator Jim DeMint, now former Senator J John Ensign, uh, uh, um, Senator Inhofe, Senator Coburn.